Australia. <clears throat> So hello everybody, thanks for joining us here today. My name is Leslie Ogilvie, I'm the director of the Secretariat at the Global AMR R&D Hub and moderator of today's session, uh, Race Against Resistance. Uh, in the next hour and 15 minutes, we're going to be discussing one of the top 10 global health challenges that humanity is facing today, antimicrobial resistance, and in particular, the current antibiotic development and access crisis. We know that antibiotics are the cornerstone of modern medicine, but we also know that the research and development pipeline for antibiotics and novel antibacterials is really insufficient to tackle the increasing emergence and spread of antibiotic resistance globally. So current predictions show that we're set to enter a post-antibiotic era by 2050 if no action is taken now drug-resistant infections will become the leading de a cause of death worldwide if we don't take action now with disastrous socio-economic consequences. In recent years, we've seen a lot of political commitment to action against AMR, but now we need to make sure that we translate that political commitment into actual action. And this is what we want to explore today. How can we encourage more action and more accountability in AMR, especially in the face of a growing antibiotic development and access crisis? And to do this, to explore which priority actions are needed, we have a distinguished and expert panel joining us today, covering a range of diverse perspectives. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Christopher Fern, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Health of Malta and also the Vice Chair of the Global Leaders Group on AMR. We have Damiette Onderstahl, a seconded national expert from DG Hera and the European Commission. We have Anka Thoma, uh, Executive Director of the European Patients Forum, and Professor Kevin Outison, who's the Executive Director of CarbX, and, uh, and also Dr. Paul Vandenbroeke, Vice President for Global Government Affairs at Shinogi Europe. But before we meet our panellists, I want to put you, the audience, to work a little bit and find out how much you actually know about the scale of the AMR challenge, and in particular the antibiotic development crisis. So I have a few questions and a few numbers for you that may actually help to contextualise the scale of the, of the problem. So when I prompt you, I'd like you to put your, your hands up. We're gonna, I think the questions are going to come up behind me. Oh, yeah, there they are. Okay, so do you know what is the annual number of deaths caused by malaria globally? If you think it's 640,000, please, please put your hand up. So nobody, okay, 860,000, anybody? Okay, yeah, I see a few hands raised, or do you think it's 1.27 million? Okay, a lot more hands for, for that. The actual answer is, is going to come up, 860,000. So again, this is just to keep, keep the context in for the AMR, AMR challenge. What are the annual numbers of deaths caused by HIV AIDS globally? Do you know this? Is it 640,000? Hands up, if you think it's 640,000. 800... Okay, so it hasn't, it hasn't moved on. Yeah, now it's Ah. Can move on. That would be great. Ah, uh, there we go. <laughs> okay, but it's still the same. It's still malaria. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm like mad. Okay. Okay. We've seen it already. You've seen it already. You know. You know what it is. <laughs> So now we've got malaria. So you know malaria is 860,000. HIV AIDS, it's 640,000. Let's go to the number of deaths caused by drug resistant infections each year. So if you think it's 640,000, put your hands up. 860,000. A few takers, 1.27 million. Yes, so it's great to see that you do know the, the scale of the challenge we're facing, AMR. So we have a high mortality rate, but do we have the tools to actually 
uh, mitigate the impacts of AMR. So again, to put this in context a little bit, let's look at the oncology sector. How many products are in the R&D pipeline for new oncology medicines at the moment? Is it 200? Hands up. OK, one, one person, a couple of people there. Or 7,000? Yes, correct, it's 7,000. And so let's compare this to the number of products in the R&D pipeline for new antibiotics. So with a process of el elimination, I think you can, you can tell it's 200. Yeah. But that's 30 times, or more than 30 times less than, in, than what's in development for oncology um, medicines. So I think these numbers serve to highlight that we've got a really truly global health problem here. It's compounded by the colliding calamities almost of increasing resistance, high mortality, and an already weak development pipeline. So how do we communicate the scale and the urgency of this problem? Well, I think I really have the pleasure to really introduce the trailer of the BBC Storyworks documentary, Race Against Resistance, the namesake of our session today. And it's done a really beautiful and convincing job of communicating the scale, the urgency and the reality of the scale of the life and death struggle we are facing to save antibiotics. So please watch, uh, maybe not enjoy, but um, I would really advise you to watch here. Bacteria have now evolved so that there is resistance in some bacteria to every major class of antibiotic we've produced. In short, the drugs don't work. Antibiotics are the very foundation of our entire medical system. It's built on antibiotics. Without being able to control infection, without new antibiotics, everything fails. The whole system topples. And with it, so does humanity. So 10 years ago, when I was Chief Medical Officer for England, what I saw was that superbugs, bugs that don't respond to the treatments, the antibiotics we give them, were rising. Meanwhile, the big pharmaceutical companies had closed down their research in general. So we have an antibiotic pipeline that's empty, no new drugs coming to treat patients, and patients getting sick and dying. I remember having the gradual onset of pain in my left hamstring. I didn't think that much of it. You know, as a gymnast, you're always working through aches and pains. It's just part of the sport. But over the course of the week, nothing seemed to be making it better. I remember meeting my mom, and she took me right to the emergency room. that I had a 15 centimeter abscess deep to my hamstring and associated muscle infection. They started me on broad spectrum antibiotics and then you know within 48 hours they realized these antibiotics aren't working the way that we thought that they would. In that moment I was fighting for my life. I remember the trauma surgery team talking to my dad and my dad coming back in the room with tears in his eyes. You know, Dad, are they gonna have to amputate my leg? And he couldn't answer me. They discovered that I had a methicillin-resistant Staph aureus infection, or MRSA. In order to gain control of the infection, the doctors put me on some of the strongest antibiotics to treat the infection that was raging in my bloodstream. I didn't have any knowledge or awareness of antimicrobial resistance at that point. I did not think that it was something that I would ever have to worry about. Of course, 
when we get new antibiotics, I, when I was chief medical officer, wanted to put them in a safe and lock them up because the more they're used, the more resistance will rise to them. And that limits profit that any company can make. In one sense, the drug companies can't win, but I believe they owe it to humanity to do something. What we have to find is a way to pay for the drugs however much you need and use, but keep them like fire extinguishers somewhere safe where they're only used when nothing else will work. The way we have tried in Britain, we're now putting into routine practice, is what's called a subscription mechanism, very like video on demand. You pay a subscription every month, and you might watch one, you might watch none, or you might watch a lot. We piloted with two really useful antibiotics, and the NHS sent contracts with those companies that they would supply as much or as little as we wanted to use. So they know how much money they're going to get, and we can husband and look after the drugs so they save lives, but we're not driving resistance. I think quite often about how would my outcome have been different if we didn't have that second or that third antibiotic available to treat my infection? What world are we going to give our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, if we've lost all the antibiotics and they go back to dying of a scratch they got in the garden when playing? I think that deserves a round of applause, doesn't it? <laughs> it's powerful. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Chris Fern to the stage. Dr. Chris Fern. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Good morning. So, I would just like your first thoughts on the trailer that we've seen. It's, it was very powerful, wasn't it? It was, and I think a couple of messages, certainly, that, that come through. The first is most people are unaware that there is an, an, an antibiotic resistance problem or an antimicrobial resistance problem. We, we heard that um, for, for, for the gymnast who was, was in, 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 at risk of losing her limb, it was the first time she actually heard when it happened to her that there was a possibility that antibiotics would not work. And if you go out on the street, you'll find 99 out of 100 people who are unaware that there is this, this, this massive problem. So this is one of the biggest issues that we have now, um, which is making people aware that there is this and it is a, a major problem, that there is this major problem, because unless there is the, a public outcry, then um, many governments, I won't say all governments, but many governments will find it easy to ignore the problem. So we, we, this needs to come up on the agenda, and, it, it, and, 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 and this has to happen. And this has to happen in two ways. One, we need more surveillance, so we need to know exactly the extent of the problem. If, even, even people who are involved, we need to know. We have um, a, a rough idea of, of, of what it involves and the extent of the problem in human health. We have very little knowledge of what happens in the animal world, because they're all, uh, all, all, all interrelated. And we have practically no knowledge of what happens in the environment. Um, and we need the surveillance. So we need this data, because this is what will drive then our campaigns to, 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 to make sure that it's on the public agenda. And then we need advocacy. We need to make sure that this is coming out um, and people are aware of it, and people are a bit panicked. I mean, if you look at what happened with COVID, a lot of the decisions that governments made, maybe not always correctly, were driven by by demand on social media and by public clamoring for, for that, there was a bit of panic. 
I'm not advocating panic, but I'm saying that this needs to come up on the agenda. So that's the first point. Secondly, it is, it's happening now. This isn't, um, you, you, I don't know whether you remember, you remember with climate change up to a few years ago, we used to say, unless we do this, unless we do that, we're going to have climate change and we're going to have uh, fires, devastating and floods and heat waves. Well, it's happening, it's happened, it's, it's not, Climate change is happening now. And it's the same with AMR. It's happening now, we need, and, and, and this needs to come out. So, um, so certainly, yes, um, I, I would say the biggest obstacle we have now to finding, um, and not just to, to working out what solutions we need, but to implementing the solutions that we need, including national action plans, is that uh, the general public is not aware enough and therefore not putting pressure enough on the politicians to do something about it. Thank you so much. It's definitely not a silent pan pandemic anymore, AMR. I was wondering if I may, I was just w really interested in what got you interested in AMR in the first place. Well, I am by training a surgeon. So I've, I've, um, I've seen this firsthand, not on myself, luckily, but I've seen it on, on a number of my patients. So I've, I've always been aware of this. And then in, as, as a health minister, um, you start to realize that this is, a, that this is an, um, a real existential um, situation that we are in. The OECD just published a report a couple of weeks back. Um, and the, the OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Yeah? It's, it's, it's a group, if you like, of about 28 or 29 of the richer countries, but um, so the OECD and, and the EU and the EU countries, there's data for, for, AM, for AMR in human health um, within this region. And, they, and they've just published data, which shows that one in five, one in five, so that's, that's, that's 20 percent, of bacterial infections happening now are resistant to antibiotics. One in five. So that, I mean, 20 percent of bacterial infections happening now are resistant to antibiotics. It, it's, it's a very, very big number. Even one in, one in 500 would be a big number, but one in five, can you imagine that? One in five of bacterial infections are resistant now as we speak to antibiotics. And it will get worse. The, the, the OECD report estimates that by 2035, so that's 11 years time, 90% of hospital acquired, of hospital acquired bacterial infections will be resistant, 90%. So imagine you go into hospital and there's a bigger risk of you dying because you acquire a, a multi-resistant um, infection whilst you're in hospital than, the, than by dying with the condition that you've gone into hospital with. So hospitals will be, we will need to close hospitals now, basically, um, because they'll be more dangerous than, than leaving somebody to, 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 to get treated in the community. So this is what we're talking about. It's, and, and this is happening now. It's, it's, uh, I, I go back to the, to, the, to the example of climate change. Many of us didn't believe that climate change would happen, but it's happening, and the AMR is happening as well. So we, need, we really need to do something about it, and, and, and we need to, to do something about it now. Yeah, the time to act is, is now. I, I fully agree. This is a nice, a nice link to the work that you're doing as part of the, the Global Leaders Group on AMR. Could you share um, some thoughts about that work and your priorities? The, the Global Leaders Group is an advocacy group. It's a political group. It's, it's mandated by the United Nations, um, and it's the, the advocacy limb of the quadripartite um, organization. So AMR is, is not only a global um, issue, but it's also a one health issue. In other words, it's um, human health, animal health, environment, food security, the whole. So the United Nations mandated the four um, major uh, organizations, so World Health Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and the United Nations Environment Program. So these are the quadripartite organizations. And these quadripartite um, Organise this global leaders group as a as an advocacy, more or less, um, limb for for bringing forward the MR. Um, and this is exactly what the global leaders group does. It 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 
pushing to bring AMR onto the agenda. Again, the United Nations General Assembly has now asked the Global Leaders Group to lead a high-level meeting on AMR this time next year. Um, and, and, and we started to work there after we, after the, well, we had the high-level meetings last week um, in New York. We're now going to AMR. Um, so this is where we are. The good news is that um, doing something about AMR and investing in AMR um, is less expensive than doing nothing. So doing nothing on AMR carries a, a high, not only um, morbidity and mortality, as we've been talking, uh, burden, but it also has a very fine, a, a high financial burden. And again, I refer back to the OECD report. Um, every euro that you spend on preventing AMR now saves you five euros um, down the line. So the benefit to cost ratio of investing in AMR prevention is five is to one, which is high. Um, so if, if you ask any, any investor um, for that, uh, if you give any investor that rate of return, they'll jump to it. So, I, uh, so governments should really jump to this because the cost of doing nothing is five times as expensive as uh, just financially, <laughs> we're not talking about misery and, 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 and suffering, just financially the cost of doing nothing is five times as expensive as tackling AMR um, today. In terms of the GLG work that you're doing, are there any activities um, that you can tell us about the, in the lead up to the Well, we're, the meeting? We're, we're now, as, as we've just said, we're now um, gearing up for the high level meeting during next year's uh, United Nations General Assembly. Um, this year we had three high level meetings um, on universal healthcare, on tuberculosis, and on pandemic preparedness. I have to say the political declarations were somewhat disappointing. They were very comprehensive, they were all encompassing, but they were not focused. So what we need to do, um, in, to my mind, is to have focused, a focused political declaration with buy-in from, from, from all um, United Nations member states um, and, and with clear ideas and with clear targets. Unless we have targets, it will all be pie in the sky. And we'll just be here next year and the year after and saying, hey, Mars is a problem, we need to do something. So we, we need to act. To me, the most essential component are the national action plans. Following the first high-level meeting um, on AMR a few years back, practically all, all countries around the world, or member states, or United Nations member states, have national action plans. And these national action plans are targeted to the priorities in, in the specific country. So if we talk about uh, what is happening in Europe, find the most important thing is possibly um, hand hygiene, um, hospital acquired infections, the antibiotic or the antimicrobial pipeline, and better diagnostics. Um, so, so we're talking this somewhat high tech. But if you go to, to low-income countries or to the global south, you'll find that the, the, the reality on the ground is different. You have people who, are, who don't have um, sanitation, who don't have sewage, who don't have access to clean water, um, who have vast major problems with access to, to, not to innovative antibiotics, to established antibiotics, and have problems with falsified antibiotics. Um, and these are best addressed uh, nationally or regionally, uh, and, and this is what, what the national action plans do. The problem with national action plans are that very, very few, less than 10%, um, have the financing for them. So they are not being implemented. Um, and this is one of the things we need to look at. We need to look at, um, because this is a global issue, if you have uh, a resistance strain emerging anywhere in the world, it will, it, it, it will spread. I mean, we've seen this with, with COVID. You get it in, within six months, it, it, it spread around the world, which with, 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 with you know what happened. The same happens with, anti, with, with, with um, resistant organisms. It, it happens somewhere in the world, it will happen everywhere. So we need global solidarity with this. We need to help out low and, and middle income countries to have the financial muscle to implement the national action plans. And I think this is one of the, one of the goals that um, the Global Leaders Group is pushing for. 
Thank you for that. We'll be following those activities with lots of interest within the community. So let's fast forward to December 31st, 2024. What's success going to look like <laughs> for you on that date? What, well, what, what's, your, what's on your wish list? Well, um, let's be, antimicrobial resistance will not disappear by <laughs> December <laughs> of next year. Um, but what I would like to have happened by, by this time next year is to have a global agreement on targets. Now, targets do, might not have to be um, a single target which is applicable for everyone. Um, indeed, there are some countries who are so so well advanced in their in in, in their um, in the in, in the control and, for instance, in the consumption of antibiotics or in in in, in stewardship, uh, even in veterinary medicine, that. Um, Cutting, cutting, you know, they're already high enough in, in the targets so that um, for them saying 50, uh, you have to decrease by another 50 percent doesn't make sense because they, they're already there. Um, conversely, there, are, there will be other, other regions, other countries where it will be unreal, unrealistic to expect, um, for instance, with, where, where poverty is prevalent um, and people depend on, on one or two cows for 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 the livelihood, the situation is completely different when you're talking about um, farming. In this situation, to to farms where there are a, a thousand cattle, and 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 we're talking about um, it's not livelihoods now. We're talking about profits. So we need targets, but targets need to be specific to specific countries and to specific regions. So possibly again, targets might have to be linked to the national action plans, because the national action plans, as we are saying, are specific and are, are tailored to the specific realities in different countries. So if you ask me what would be success, what would success look like in, um, by the end of 2024, I would say this. I would say that we would have agreed that national action plans um, have the financing to be implemented and that this financing is linked to, to specific targets um, and agree, which are agreed upon um, by the different member states. That sounds like a good target to, to be wishing for. Uh, we're really interested in the AMR R&D targets, by the way, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, looking at Europe in more specifically, um, what important actions can EU member states and the European Commission be implementing right, right now? Well, as, as you point out, this is... Um, it's a, this is a cross, this is one of the areas where cross-border um, cooperation and collaboration makes sense. So, by 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 its own um, by, by necessity, a lot of healthcare delivery is is country specific and therefore falls within the competence of of the individual individual countries, even within the European Union. But then there are some issues, and this is one of them where cross-border or international, or regional, or European collaboration makes sense. Um, we've just passed through, we are in, 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 in the calm between storms when it comes to pandemics. So we've just passed from one pandemic, we're going to other. If, um, if you want to say AMR is, a, is, a, is a, another pandemic, fine, climate change is another. Um, but certainly we, we're, we're in between um, pandemics in the infection sense, if you like. Now is the time to, to, to have the pandemic preparedness agreed on and, and, and implemented. And the AMR, or tackling AMR, has to be part of, of um, our pandemic preparedness program or treaty, if you like, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's not being easy to implement. Um, people tend to forget what we've just been through less than two years ago. Um, ministers change, people change, um, agendas change. Governments um, have different pressures. We need to keep health on the agenda. We need to make sure that health is indeed prioritized. Um, and we need to keep AMR on, on, on the health agenda itself, which is why I come back to the original point, and, which was the point that made by, 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 your, by your video clip. We need people to be aware and to be frightened uh, and to push uh, the governments to and, and for government action against AMR to be actually popular, because it involves money, it involves government 
um, governments siphoning off or directing money from elsewhere onto AMR. And at the moment, you are all aware because of um, different reasons, government spending is, is, is tight at the moment. Um, and unless the AMR is perceived to be a, a popular way for governments to, to, to spend money, unfortunately, we are in an age of populism where governments um, not necessarily do what is strictly right, but do to a certain extent what is popular. We need to accept that reality, or we need to, um, if not accept it, be aware of that reality and, and make sure that AMR is high on government's um, agendas. I think it's a great place to pause for now, and thank you very much, Dr. Fern. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah. So it's now my pleasure to welcome the rest of the panelists to the stage. Please, please come up. Everyone found their place, that's great. So we have Damiette Anderstahl, seconded national expert from DG Hera, the European Commission. Anka Thoma, uh, executive director of the European Patients Forum. Professor Kevin Outerson, sitting next to me from the executive director of CARB-X. Dr. Paul van der Brucke, for, uh, the vice president for global, global government affairs at Shinogi Europe. Thank you all so much for being here. It's, uh, we've got a, a big, it's a big topic, we've got a lot of questions, so I think we should make a, a start. I'm going to start with you, Kevin. Professor Alderson. I can call you Kevin. Kevin is great. Okay. <laughs> so you've created one of the most diverse and innovative pipelines of antibacterial pro products through, through CARBEX. You're coordinating the world's early R&D activities, you're putting a lot of effort into it, you're receiving funding from multiple countries, G7 countries and other institutions. Is that enough? I think everyone would be surprised if we thought it was completely enough, yeah. right? Um, but uh, what Chris said earlier, there's just so much progress since the high-level meeting in 2016. Uh, we have uh, push incentives like CARBEX and, and GARP, we have the AMR Action Fund, uh, we have national action plans that, that are not well-funded, but still there exist and, and they're a point for moving forward. And so for CARBEX, you know, we've sifted through 1,500 applications from more than 40 countries. We've selected 92 to fund. There'll be another dozen in the next quarter. Um, I can say that there's help on the way, that the, the basic science that people have been doing in universities around the world is extraordinary. There are new things coming. But what's needed is for them to get to the market after they've left CARBEX and completed clinical development and actually have a successful market entry. This is what you know, the pull incentives that we're talking about what uh, was on the clip from Dame Sally that England has done and what Canada has proposed, what Europe has proposed. You know, if, if you were skiing, it would be ridiculous to say, um, what do you want, the skis or the boots, right? You know, I mean, you need both, <laughs> right? And for antibiotics, we, we need the work that we're doing and other push incentives, but we have to finish that job with a, you know, an economic case so that the companies aren't bankrupt. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday or the day before um, talking about how every single small company that's been approved with an antibiotic in the last, new antibiotic last decade, either in the US or Europe, has either gone bankrupt uh, or been acquired at a, at a fraction of their, of their R&D investor's value or is in the process of shutting down. Not just a couple of them, all of them, okay? And these are the companies that we should be celebrating because they actually made it to FDA approval. So we need push, what we do, we need pull, which is what governments are working on now. Maybe I can stay with you, Kevin, and we, we talk about push and pull a lot. Maybe you can explain what push and pull are in case some of the audience members don't know. And what should the, the, the characteristics of these push and pull mechanisms be to make sure that we actually are are able to buy the, the products that we need? Well, push would be anything that subsidized or s supported the development of a product. So at the basic level, national grants to universities to start basic research, that's a push incentive. A CARBEX 
We're a nonprofit. We're funded by governments and philanthropies. We make grants to the small companies or research institutes and universities to advance their product from uh, the basic idea stage until we finish at the end of the first in human clinical trials. Then there's other push incentives that support them through the advanced clinical development uh, all the way to approval. A pull incentive is something that happens after regulatory approval. So really it's paying only for success in the sense that you have something that's approved. And you wouldn't have to pay for everything that's approved, you get to pick and choose. Just like we don't fund at CarbEx every project that's applied, 1,500 have applied, we funded 92 at present, that's a small percentage. With a pull incentive you look at what would benefit public health the most. And those are the products, and only those products, uh, should get this, this pull incentive. Um, anytime you're putting public money at risk on things like this, you can put conditions. At, at Carbex, every single contract we've signed has the same requirement that follows the intellectual property until the expiration of the patent, which says that the product has to be used in ways that, that support global access, not just in the rich countries, but around the world, and global stewardship, we don't waste them. At a pull incentive, you can be even more specific and directive, and you can also think about things like uh, security of the supply chain. Thanks for that very clear explanation. I was wondering if I can call upon Professor von der Broek to, to comment on what Kevin's just said about these fundamental characteristics of push and pull incentives as well, and what, what these characteristics should be. Yes, and absolutely. So, the, uh, so one thing that I think is important uh, here is that they're complementary. And they're uh, both facets of, of what the solution uh, should be. The other one, I think, is that it's really very urgent to consider pull incentives now. Because when you think about the R&D timelines that we're working with, today we're making decisions about products that will be available to patients 10 years from now. And so I think that's very important to keep in mind when we th have conversations about different types of pull incentives, for instance. The urgency of doing this and doing this in a coordinated way, I think, is, is a major element in this as well. So we've had a number of conversations at the Hub about the size and duration of a pool incentive. And you know, the, com the, the feedback that we have is that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter as long as it's big enough, the size is big enough and the duration is, is long enough. Is that something you would agree with? And I, I think what is important in a pool incentive is that uh, it is sustainable over the long term, that it provides a predictable environment for those of us who are involved in uh, planning uh, and developing uh, new uh, antibiotics, not only antibiotics, but also antifungals and antivirals. It's very important for us to know that 10 years from now, all the investments that we've made, all the failures that we've had, actually will be repaid in a significant way. No, that's, that's great to hear. I mean, I'm going to stay with you, Paul, actually, if you don't mind, because um, Shinogi is one of the, the, the few companies that are still on the market sort of developing innovative antibiotics and actually bringing them to the people that, that need them. Can you just tell us a bit more about uh, your, the ethos there and what your plans are in, yes. in the future? Sure. So uh, infectious disease is in the DNA of our company. It has been for the past 140 odd uh, years. And, um, and so uh, it is something that uh, we spend uh, probably the largest percentage of revenue on of any large uh, pharmaceutical uh, company. And so, uh, and we're d developing, uh, we're one of the few, as you said, still developing uh, drugs. And this is particularly important uh, when we realized that a few weeks ago, actually, one of the major players pulled back. And, uh, and so, which is a major loss for our fight against antimicrobial resistance. So, so I'm very proud, actually, uh, to be part of a company that is still willing to take the risk to do this. Um, the second thing also is it's not only about product development, it's also about uh, providing the tools for uh, adequate antimicrobial stewardship. And uh, so we're part of the FIFLI uh, AMR register, where we share the surveillance data that we have, also other companies share that, that helps researchers uh, focus their research efforts, but it also helps with antimicrobial stewardship efforts and how to 
uh, focus uh, these uh, as well. So that's part of what our overall responsibility uh, is as well in this field. And then also we're part of uh, a number of partnerships. Uh, perhaps the most important one of these is the uh, GARD P Chai agreement that we have. So with uh, uh, Global Antibiotics Research and Development Partnership and the Clinton Health Access uh, Initiative, where we are aiming to provide access to one of our antibiotics in uh, low and middle income uh, countries. And that also has uh, a uh, stewardship component and also manufacturing uh, component where we actually just signed, uh, well, the partnership just signed an agreement with a manufacturer uh, to produce uh, that antibiotic for uh, LMICs. And then finally, we're also involved with uh, AMR Action Fund, uh, where industry has put together a $1 billion fund to fund the development of up to four antibi new antibiotics uh, before uh, 2030. Congratulations on the, the excellent work that you're doing. In you. uh, I can almost describe it as a unicorn, in a sense, you know, this magical being that's uh, actually doing great work. I just want to stay on this, this idea of push and pull incentives and how they can really complement each other. And I wonder, this is a question for both Kevin and Paul, you know, just how, how do we really make sure that once they're implemented that they do complement each other and they do what they need to? So um, some people have looked at pull incentives and said, well, there's not a lot of outstanding drugs in the pipeline. And my, my response to that is that if you looked at the preclinical pipeline where CARBEX operates, taking things that are coming out of universities, there's really a tremendous amount of innovation. And if you give it time, uh, the products that are graduating out of CARBEX will eventually make it to phase two and phase three and eventually be approved. It'll take another five or, or 10 years. Uh, so if you want pull incentives to succeed, you need push incentives that are focusing investment on innovative things. And if you want push incentives to succeed, what we do, I need the companies when they eventually get approval by EMA or FDA not to go bankrupt. I, I don't want the Wall Street Journal to publish an article in 10 years saying it's still happening. So these things are complementary and mutually dependent. You need both. You, you can't ski without the ski or the boots. You, you, I guess you could try, but it would be a mistake to try. And, and they also <clears throat> address two uh, quite different um, phases of uh, uh, the R&D uh, process that need different involvement of um, capital, skills, and also uh, in involvement of different organizations. And so uh, it's very important for uh, companies that are very good at developing drugs, at uh, bringing them in uh, phase three and to market, that they have this constant stream that comes up from academia, from smaller companies, of products that are being developed with the help of push incentives and with the help of pull incentives, we can get these over the line to patients. Thanks for those clear explanations. I've, I'm learning a lot here as well. I'm gonna now sort of ask Damietz now about the European perspective. We know that a lot of stakeholders are calling for action on push and pull incentives. And so it would just be interesting to know what the, the plans in terms for the European Commission, what they're doing in this respect. Thank you, Damien. Yes, of course, thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to start with the fact that it's really indeed a team effort from the Commission. So it's not only DG Hera working on the push and pull incentives, but it's very much a collaboration. So if you look through the pipeline, uh, and I would quickly go through, uh, then on the uh, push incentive, so to say, RTD has done a lot in the past already through uh, Horizon programs. Uh, and we're going to continue that work uh, with the One Health platform in 25, where we allocate another 100 million uh, to the push incentives. Uh, on top of that, HERA uh, has included uh, in, in HERA Invest uh, AMR innovations. Uh, so companies could, could request a grant at EIB, which is in theory alone, but uh, should, should help investors to make it more interesting to go for that. Um, 
And if you then move on further in the pipeline, so to say, to the pool incentives, it's also very much a team effort, I would say, uh, because DG Sante put uh, the data protection voucher in the pharma regulation, uh, which is right now under negotiation together with the member states. And uh, HERA conducted a study earlier this year, uh, which was published, in which we uh, evaluated different financial pool incentives. Uh, we had four different mechanisms uh, evaluated in that study. Uh, and you could see that they are very uh, adaptable towards the situation. So uh, the amount of money you can decide and the mechanism whether you would like to incentivize uh, development or access or both, so to say. Um, and even with the voucher in place, it's very important that indeed, like Kevin said, if products make it to the market, that, that the companies do not go bankrupt. For example, in Europe, if you look to the statistics since 2010, uh, 14 products reached the market or e EMA approval, uh, but less than half of those products are, are widely accessible in Europe, even better. I, 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 th I think you can consider three products widely accessible in Europe and more than half, not even accessible in half of the member states. So where we're looking into at first for, for HERA is under eu for health 23 to uh, be very much inspired by the Swedish model and look into uh, EU multi-country pool incentive for, for access and availability because those products need to reach the patients also in smaller member states. Thanks, Damia. It's great that you're mentioning access here because uh, we haven't actually spoke about that at all uh, up to now. But I'm going to go to Anka at the, the very end there. And I think it's very important to get a the civil society and patient perspectives. And you know, why, why should European citizens actually be concerned about AMR in the first place? You know, why do we need a, a patient representative for, for AMR? Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, European citizens have to care about antimicrobial resistance because it can affect any, any one of us. Uh, we saw in the... Um, my notes. We saw in the in the trailer of the BBC that a healthy athlete had an antimicrobial resistant uh, infection. It came out of nowhere and it nearly killed her. Um, this can literally happen to anyone. But the reason the patient community, the chronic disease patient community that I represent, cares about this is because chronic patients are intensive users of healthcare. And by, through that, they are more exposed to bacteria that occur in, um, well, first, immunocompromised patients, surgery patients. All surgery patients depend on antibiotic. Uh, cancer patients, um, people on immunosuppressants, transplant patients, uh, a huge community, millions and millions of people um, are exposed to bacteria. Um, the ICUs are, um, sorry, intensive care units are, I, I, I'm trying really hard to not use um, abbreviations. Um, intensive care units are teeming with hospital-acquired infections. Many of those, most of those infections are resistant to at least one strain of, uh, of antibiotics, one type of antibiotics. So it's really, really important because um, it's, it's this um, sort of boiling a frog situation. It's been growing slowly, and uh, we kind of take it for granted that you go to a hospital and you're at risk of catching something, but we shouldn't take it for granted. And it's important also because any use of antibiotics can, um, take, uh, can make bacteria learn, evolve, and, uh, and develop resistance. So prudent use is crucial. But prudent use alone is not enough. Much as we've made so much progress in stewardship, um, it is not enough. So from a patient perspective, what we want to see is that alternatives are available and accessible. So that takes me to access, but also to the societal importance of it. Thank you, Anka. That's, uh, you really highlight the, the crucial facets of the patient perspective and the, 
the importance to all of us and why we should be caring about the antibiotic development and access crisis. We know that patient advocacy has worked really well in other areas, such as oncology, but it doesn't seem to be working so well in the AMR field. What's going wrong? Can we, can we actually learn lessons from, from other, other areas and share that knowledge in any way? I think, um, well, we haven't cured cancer, so patient yeah. advocacy uh, <laughs> hasn't achieved its full potential in, uh, in this, and only about 5% of our diseases actually have treatments. So we're, we're far off. Um, um, now, in antimicrobial resistance, um, patient advocacy, I'm saying this with all humility, I think we need to get more vocal and we need to get more active and we need to, um, and it's something that we at EPF really want to, to invest our time and efforts in um, raising awareness of this. Because outside of this room, what Minister Fern said earlier, most people don't see it. It's not obvious because we kind of take it for granted. Um, so we want to be more involved in raising awareness of this and we want to raise awareness also of the, not just the fact that there is a risk for the entire population, but the immediate risk is for the most vulnerable of us, for, for patients. Um, so I think our first role is really in, um, in raising this awareness, but also we want to be working uh, with uh, with all stakeholders to um, to bring the patient perspective into and the patient voice into the development, early development, like with every drug, uh, early development, but also later stages and and post uh, marketing. Um, uh, surveillance. So um, we have a lot of work to do and we're very committed to doing it. Thanks. Thanks, Anka. I think the, the film that we've just seen, the trailer, is a, a really good example of how we can turn up the volume a little bit and make people a bit more aware. So, yeah. Completely agree. Yeah, thanks. Um, Damiette, I just wonder if I can come back to you and just... We, we, we're, we're here in Europe, we're at the, the European Health Forum here. And I'm just wondering if we can think about what the Commission can do in terms of knowledge sharing between EU member states. You know, the, we, we talk, this, uh, talk about this a lot and uh, the hub as well. You know, we have 17 different countries there and we try to say, okay, if we're going to talk about pool incentives, we need to sort of be speaking to each other as, as well. And I just wondered if you have any sort of thoughts on that, how we could better knowledge share and track progress in terms of what we're doing. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think for knowledge sharing, uh, it, it's indeed very important to not only share the experiences of the program, like the evaluation of the pilots in the UK and in in, in, in Sweden, etc., but it's also very important to uh, to select wisely, as earlier said in this panel. So what we are, are going to do is to establish a platform, not only with member states, but also with other relevant stakeholders to, to discuss these matters. Uh, it's, it's important to stay connected to international fora to indeed uh, align with, with how, we, uh, how we aim the pool incentive, so to say. So it's a joint effort with a fair share of all the, all the continents, so to say. Um, and this platform will be established under HERA, but we will also include the platform of the to be established joint action JAMRAI 2, where there will be another platform with uh, uh, stakeholders and member states. And to track the progress, it's of course the evaluation of all these pilots, uh, but something completely different but very hands-on and practical, I would say, is the establishment of, of wastewater surveillance and the sequencing uh, uh, capacity building we're doing in EU, but also outside the EU, because then you can see, really see the impact in reality, so to say. Thanks for that. It's great to hear that there's lots of initiatives ongoing and it's quite broad and comprehensive, so thank you. So I've got some general questions now that I would like to ask, and it's open to anybody, so please, please shout. <laughs> can I come in a bit on, yes, on this um, Poland portion sentence? Of, of course. A, a bit of real politic, because at the end of the day we can talk a lot, but then it's what, it's what um, is doable that, that counts. So let's go back one step. Um, why do we need incentives in the first place? Um, we don't need incentives for uh, oncology treatments or for new... 
anxiolytics because those are blockbuster drugs and companies make big profits um, which will compensate for, for, for the, the failures in their R&D. But with, and with new antibiotics there is market failure. Now this is an important point to make because there is something within the European Union which is called state aid. You are not allowed to, to governments are not allowed to um, give subsidies to companies uh, and to private industry because it will skew the, 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 the competition. Except, well, there are other exceptions, but may, one of the exceptions is if there is market failure. So with the development of new antimicrobials, issues of state aid are, are, are put aside. So it is possible for European member states to subsidize the pharmaceutical companies to bring new antimicrobials onto the market. When it comes to the pull incentives, there are two main, main um, mechanisms which are being discussed. One is what Sir Davis mentioned and what the UK, um, I think Australia do a bit and Canada do, which is the subscription model, in other words, so you pay um, a company a given amount of money if they bring a new drug onto the market and not according to how much you use, but at a fixed price, so the, the, the company knows there's a profit coming in, um, and you have your antibiotic, which you can or, cannot, or, or you, you can use judiciously, and therefore prevent that becoming um, prone to resistance. The other the problem with this, with this one is that it needs buy-in from a, a lot of member states, because otherwise, it doesn't become workable. The, the amount of money that one, comp one country can put into the subscription model um, will, not, will probably not be enough to, 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 to be a, a significant pull incentive. The second um, mechanism which um, the industry, especially FPM and the Commission in its pharmaceutical strategy um, is pushing for is the, is the so-called voucher system. In other words, member states, um, pharmaceutical industry, pharmaceutical companies which bring an innovative antibiotic onto the market can have the patent on another blockbuster drug that they have extended by nine months or if they don't have that um, blockbuster drug themselves, they can sell this extension of the patent to another company. And this is estimated to be, to, to be anything in the region of one, uh, to, 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 to cost between one and five billion, billion euros each voucher, which is significant. Um, but most member states are against this. So, so this is the real politic. The, the, the commission wants it, uh, or is proposing it. The industry wants it, but most member states are against it because they feel that there will be a disproportionate amount of money being put in by, 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 um, by member states um, and, and, and to, 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 to the disproportionate benefit of, of, of the industry. But we need a solution. And, um, and to my mind, and this is what uh, we are discussing now within the Global Leaders Group, and we will probably have a, a position paper on this very soon, is that we need to link this innovation and, and the pull incentives for innovative antibiotics with access, if not just for innovative antibiotics, but also for established antibiotics globally. Because, as I said previously, in Europe, we, the problem is that we need new antibiotics. Globally, especially in, in, in low-income countries, especially in the global south, it's not new antibiotics, it's antibiotics that they need. Mo uh, uh, the majority of people on, on, uh, on, on our planet do not have access to antibiotics, period. Not new antibiotics, antibiotics at all. So if we link, if we link this, if we say, look, we will um, go for a voucher system, m give you the pull incentives, but you have to make sure, industry, that you are making sure that there is access even to the older antibiotics everywhere equitably, um, which will allow patients to get treated better, will allow falsified medicines on the black market to, 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 to be defeated, and which will stop the emergence of new, or will decrease the emergence of new um, resistant bugs, then we might link that with, with, with um, the pull incentive with the voucher. And it might be more palatable for member states. So this is something that we are looking at. This is the real politic of what's all. Uh, th thanks for those comments. It's, I'm so glad you're mentioning the access 
angle because it's something that I think should be built into to any new pool incentive that, that we develop and implement within Europe and, with, uh, and beyond. So I think we've got yeah one one and a half minutes left. So time for last comments from our from our panel. What what would be the one thing? You know we've got all these meetings coming up. We've got Anga coming up. We've got lots of e milestones. We've got the G7 uh, in Italy next year with AMR on the agenda. What would you what would be the one thing that you would change in AMR policy uh, in the lead up to these events? Kevin, can you go first? We need uh, quantitative targets coming out of uh, the political declaration. It can't be just a, a soft, squishy, we need to do act, you know, more of this or more of that. We need targets that we agree on that we can evaluate our success or, or not based on them. I agree completely. Yes. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Targets linked to the national action plans, because national action plans um, address the, the, the issue on the ground and address the priorities of the different, because the way of tackling AMR is not one, there's, there's no one solution, it's different solutions in different regions according to what the, problem, the specific problem there is. And, and the national action plans are tailored for that. So we need to make sure they are implementable, they have the finances, they have the targets, and then we need to make sure that those targets are reached. Paul, please, yeah. please go ahead. Sure. I think one of the things that would be very important is that whatever comes out of the discussions that are currently um, running, that um, this would be a coordinated effort that is very clear and also sustainable and predictable. That's really, I think, what, what we need as, uh, uh, as developers of drugs. Damiet, please. Yes, with the uh, smart speakers in advance, uh, it's always uh, difficult to add something new, but because of course we would agree with targets uh, and and yeah, shared efforts, especially on on the pool incentive. So we all go in the same same direction. So really have the discussions uh, on top of the, uh, the the already recognized kind of priorities from WHO, what you still might need per region, because of course there's some global needs, but you also have specific regional needs, and I think we should join efforts for that as well. Thank you. Anka. Ooh, we need a lot of things. Um, <laughs> okay, targets, <laughs> plans um, uh, have been mentioned. We need a... Um, an iterative process that uh, ensures both innovation and access and availability of these uh, of antibiotics, um, so that we basically safeguard uh, modern medicine as we know it, uh, so that we can continue benefiting from the innovative treatments uh, that are developed in other areas. Thank you very much. Uh, all very pertinent points that we should put together and bring to uh, to the political powers. And we've got one on, on the stage already, so that's great. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions now uh, for our, our panel. Uh, please, please do. Um, I think we can get a yes, microphone yes. here. Yeah. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for such an interesting engagement. Um, my name is uh, Mada Henry Magbiti, and I am from the European Public Health Alliance. Um, I coordinate as well the European Alliance for Responsible R&D and Affordable Medicines. I do agree to all what you've said, um, but I need to highlight some key messages uh, which resonate to this, the positions that the Alliance has been pushing forward. For instance, access, affordability, and availability of um, medicines for every citizen. And at the heart of it, uh, Honorable Minister did mention that uh, we actually need to have the interests of the people indirectly put. But that is exactly what we want to see. We want to see that, I mean, um, uh, companies that are in, engaged in this, in this space we want to see the viability of these companies, and we want to see as well um, transparency on the, 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 the kinds of funding that they receive and what they engage with. 
to embark on, basically. The other thing we need to know or, or we need to stress out is that, I mean, recently, um, uh, Digi Sante had the One Health um, AMR network meeting, the, for the first one, and uh, in the welcoming remarks, uh, Sandra Galina did mention that now we have targets from the country recommendation of AMR, and that is a framework that is actually in place to support member states on finding solutions to address AMR. So let's work together because we believe together we, we actually can, can address AMR holistically and let's engage in the discussions which we need to, to, to ensure that I mean, we are following to, to, to have solutions to this address. Thank you. Thank you. It's the power of collaboration and, and cooperation. Any other questions, please? Just in the front here, yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, please, please, please stand up. Yes, then. absolutely. Thomas Alvin from, uh, from FBI. Uh, thank you. Great, a really great debate. And, and, and I have a question, and maybe uh, particularly for, for Chris Fern, and I think you laid out the case very clearly on the different alternatives for pool mechanisms. You know, we have the subscription model, now the voucher being discussed. And you said, as we all know, that, that a lot of member states don't like the voucher because it comes with a cost. I, I think the issue here is, and I think you also laid that out very good in the beginning, that yes, developing new antimicrobials will come with a cost. And also, as you said, the scale of putting, if we're going to do it through a, a subscription model, all countries need to put money in the pot, and it will be the same cost. I mean, these will be the same cost. We can channel them through different ways. So. So I'm just wondering, how can this be uh, you know, discussed uh, in council in a way that doesn't reject a model that is on the table and would be viable and that would reach the scale? And you know, we have the legal basis for the, uh, in the EU legislation. Not dismiss that without doing something else. Because as you said, this is urgent. We need something now. And it needs to be at a certain scale. And it will come at a cost. But the cost of inaction, as you said, are so much higher. Yeah. So would you like to but, well, of course, FPM, um, um, for those who maybe don't know, uh, uh, you, you're the industry, mm -hmm. so you, you represent the industry, which is exactly what you want, um, basically more money to be able to, 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 to produce, to eventually have more profits, let's, let's, let's be honest about this, which is fine, which is fine, there's, there's, there's no problem with that. Um, governments, and, and I think Kevin made this point, governments have limited budgets, and they have responsibility of how to spend their budgets. And as we, as finances get tighter, as we come out of the emergency mechanism which allowed member states to exceed their deficit by more than 2.5%, and this is going to happen now in December, um, budgets are, governments are going to be even more aware of where, of where they are putting their money. Um, and they will probably choose to put it where there is, um, where it might be a bit popular to do so. AMR at the moment is not, which is why we need to go back to what we said originally. We need to push this up on the, onto the agenda, because you are right, um, there is market failure. Unless we put in money, then we will not get the new antibiotics. Uh, let's make it clear. Development of new antimicrobials is not the only is not the only part of the jigsaw of the solution to tackling AMR. It's just one small part of it. Um, diagnostics, vaccines, making sure that antibiotics are used correctly, even in the in, in, in animal husbandry and, and in the environment, waste. Um, so so it's, it's a big thing, but this is part of it. And certainly this is going to need money put into it because, uh, as you say, um, there is a cost to this. Um, I think we need to convince member states uh, that this is something which is worth doing, which has to be done. Um, but I think we need to link this to 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 access, um, because you, the message has to come across. Uh, the development of a new strain of anti uh, of multi-resistant uh, organism anywhere in the world will affect will affect us. So we cannot ignore the situation outside of Europe. Um, so, pushing to have access within the global environment 
um, I think will make the, the, the funding of new antibiotics by pool mechanisms, whichever, whichever, whichever one eventually we, we, we accept more palatable for member states. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions in the audience? Yeah, please stand up. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Guinard. I'm Europe lead at Wellcome Trust. Thank you. This is an amazing panel, and you've made a really strong case for having really powerful, meaningful targets um, coming out next year, and also some really compelling health and also strikingly powerful financial arguments for doing so. And I suppose kind of building on your comments um, just now, Mr. Fern, about raising this issue up the political agenda, I suppose my question would, would probably be to you kind of how do we do that? It seems to me that the case is, is so there. Obviously, appreciate that political agendas are very full. There's a, a lot of issues that need money spent on them. But... Um, in your discussions with other governments, what is it? What is it that, as health advocates, we're missing? Like, what more do we do? We need to be to be making the case for kind of what more do they need to know for for this to be a reality? Thank you. Well, I, I know the Welcome Foundation is very much into this, and very grateful for 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 your input on this and for your leadership. Um, I think we've made this point already. It, uh, unfortunately, um, we are in the age of populism. Um, and possibly this is one of the side effects of, of, of democracies, that, <laughs> that, um, that you need to go after votes um, and that uh, not governments, political movements uh, have now over the last... If, if you ask me what's changed politically over the last 20 years, I will say that the, um, the middle ground of politics has collapsed and we are now in, in the extremes. Um, and that's, that's, that becomes... a, 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 a Populism now. So, 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 um, if you look what's happening, not just in Europe, but but um, in America, and in Britain, um, populist parties or populist leaders um, win. This is what is happening. Um, so, unless something is popular, it won't happen. Unless there is the demand from from the ground. Um, for governments to do something about AMR, it, it, the governments will, will just find it more difficult to do the right thing. Some of us will, but it, it will be more difficult to do the right thing. And, and remember, um, financial decisions are not taken by, by health ministers who know what is happening, or some of us know what is happening. Financial decisions are taken by finance ministers, um, and unless, and eventually by prime ministers, and unless um, there is this this push from civil society more, more than anyone else, um, this won't happen. Thank you very much. I think Damiette wants to... to yeah, if I stuff. may add something. Um, I think with AMR the challenge might be that we uh, need to convince people that profitability is is needed. It's not always a bad bad thing, but it has a, a, a bit of a bad connotation, so to say. So what both ends from the, from the bargain, so to say, need both the patients but also the companies is predictable profitability, uh, because the governments need to know what it will cost, and the companies need to know what they will receive, so to say, to find investors for for their R and D. Um, so I think that that's something where we need to work towards and um, uh, to uh, to reach that it might be easier to to start with something uh, like, for example, scaling up indeed the Swedish model of revenue guarantee for access and availability, because if you then can showcase even in smaller member states that it actually reached the patient, that you reached something. Uh, I'm not a Minister of Health, but I've been working in the Ministry for years. It's easier to show to the Ministry of Finance as well, if you can see like, hey, but there's a, it's actually working. These pilots have effect. So if we scale this up to something else, the impact might even be bigger. So I think it's, it's both kind of this type, type of language and the time we need to evaluate things and convince. Yeah. Thank you very much, Damia. I think we've run out of time now for questions, unless there's one burning one that you have here. Questions about the national action plans uh, in regards to what mechanisms exist to ensure consistent approaches, greater coordination and collaboration in order to have a global impact, and what to do to ensure that they are implemented. Who would like to take that one? Within Europe, there is there is a mechanism. So the ECDC does a review 
I think every three years with member states to look at their action plans. So, so there is that. Uh, globally, there isn't, um, which is why you have you have to rely on on the governments and the health the health departments globally for 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 their action plans to to um, to happen. It's not, if you look at most action plans around the world, they say the right things. Um, they say the, they do the, the, the right noises. It's, it's implementing them, that's the difference. Um, and as I say, 90% of action plans do not have, uh, are not um, costed, and do not have a financial um, line item in the budget for that. So that's, that's, where we need, that's what we need to tackle. Thank you very much. I think that's all the time we have for questions again. OK, I think we've got a few minutes left for a wrap up. I think you can all agree this has been a, a very enlightening session. I've learned a lot. I think we've got some concrete steps there for the next steps. We have the solutions for the antibiotic development and access crisis. We need to implement them now. From the discussions from our panelists, the, the different aspects I'm, I'm hearing is there should be more aligned and coordinated action across the push and pull spectrum. We need predictability in financing. We need to implement national action plans and finance them appro appropriately. We need realistic and feasible targets for AMR, R&D. We need to benchmark progress and we need the stronger inclusion of patient voices at the very beginning of the development, development process. And of course, access, that should be built into everything that we're doing from, from the very beginning. I think we need to be bringing some of these comments, some of these recommendations and concrete next steps to the Spanish and uh, Belgian presidencies next year, as well as, well as to the, the Commission. They can consider them. Let's write them up. Let's give them to them on a plate. And uh, we've got a lot of uh, meetings coming up. We've got the UN high-level meeting on AMR. We've got the Italian G7 presidency next year. There's a lot to do. This is the time to act now. Let, let's do it together. What else? Half an hour, out, take half an hour out of your day and go and uh, watch that full documentary. It's powerful, it's beautiful. Um, even if you know, you, you're having your lunch, just sit and, sit and watch it and just be aware and be slightly afraid. You know, next time you go to the hospital, just be thankful that we do have the antibiotics that we have, um, that we, we, we just take it for granted. Let's not take this for granted anymore. The conversation on AMR doesn't stop here. We, if you're interested, there's another session tomorrow uh, morning at 8.45. I think we've got Laura Moran from JPMR uh, in the audience here already. And I've also been asked to remind you for both online and on-site audiences to do the evaluation survey poll on slide, Slido. And I think that's me checked off all my tick boxes. Yes, great, good. With that, I would really like to thank my amazing panelists. You've just been an absolute pleasure and honor to, to speak, speak with you. Thank you very much. So round of applause. Thank you.